Daniel Ellsberg, just to refresh my memory, what specifically was your job in the government? Well, my main work in the government before I got involved with Vietnam actually was as a consultant and an official working on nuclear war planning and command and control of nuclear weapons mm -hmm. from the late 50s as a consultant into the early 60s. Actually, I went to work in the government in part to get away from that horrendous subject to a conflict of what seemed human scale, mm -hmm. an old-fashioned war for us to win, as I saw it. That's, um, you're speaking of Vietnam. Yeah, Vietnam, mm -hmm. of all things. So I became a special assistant to the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense, mm -hmm. John, I'm sorry, to the Assistant Secretary of Defense, John McNaughton. Mm -hmm. And my job was to work entirely on Vietnam policy and planning for him. That was from August of 1964, and indeed my work actually began the night of the Tonkin Gulf reprisal by chance. And it comprised the period of the whole buildup of the bombing, starting in the spring of 65, and the introduction of troops. In July of 65, I transferred to the State Department and volunteered to go to Vietnam with General Edward Lansdale, who was doing political work for the ambassador there. I was senior liaison officer in the embassy there with the rank of FSR-1. Well, let's see now, Lansdale, Lansdale was a CIA man. No, he had been a CIA man. He'd retired from that, had worked for the Pentagon for a while, had retired from that, and now was being brought back in then as a retired officer with a team from state, defense, USIA, some CIA people. And I was basically from defense, yeah. but I transferred to state. I was assured, by the way, that this was not a CIA project. In retrospect, uh, I've learned not to know, actually, uh, whether it was or wasn't in some sense. So you, you can't say with a certainty that Lansdale was not CIA when he was there? It seems, apparently, that one never can say that very confidently of somebody who had been, as he was, an official of CIA. Uh, for example, uh, Ambassador Colby had, of course, been uh, head of South have Asian department, I think, for CIA, and then supposedly left CIA to become head of pacification in Vietnam, and was, the Senate was assured that he'd left. He came back, of course, to CIA from Vietnam. Now, was he really out of CIA when he was over there? I think that's probably hard to answer. Well, uh, in earlier conversations, you were telling me about reading the Church Committee's report and being shocked at what you learned uh, as you read that report, at the conclusions you were drawing as a result of reading that report. Well, it was very enlightening to me in many ways. I'd, for one thing, I'd had a number of clearances higher than top secret and uh, in the Pentagon. In fact, I had to give up those clearances when I went to Vietnam because you weren't allowed to uh, have such clearances in Vietnam lest you be captured. And I thought I understood the secrecy system pretty well, and I thought I knew what could be secret and what, practically speaking, could not be kept secret at a high level. But when I read the Church Committee report, I learned that my boss, Ed Lansdale, uh, with whom I'd been very close and had spent many evenings hearing his anecdotes of uh, adventures in the CIA, had in fact been in charge of what amounted to a secret war against Cuba in 1962-63, after the Bay of Pigs, so-called Operation Mongoose, which involved thousands of operations against Cuba and also recommendations from Lansdale and others that Castro be assassinated. And of course, there were assassination plots during that period. In the two years that I worked closely with him, uh, very closely, I never heard the word Cuba uh, come from his lips or the fact that he'd worked on this. And that revealed to me that there was a level of secrecy that I hadn't appreciated. I realized, for example, that uh, the report, as the Church Committee report, shows that it was possible to keep from Ambassador the Corey in Chile, and according to the report, even from Secretary of State William Rogers, the fact that the White House had ordered CIA to uh, eliminate, really, neutralize by any means necessary, uh, the chief of staff of the Chilean armed forces who stood in the way of a coup against Allende. And in fact, Schneider had been killed in the course of a kidnapping attempt. If it weren't for my own experience uh, comparing it to this report, it would have been hard for me to believe that uh, Corey, for example, could have been kept in the dark to that extent, that somebody would have broken that secrecy. But 
The point is that the government does have secrets that are so intense, so sensitive in the sense that they are so culpable, so incriminating, that um, they must be kept even from people at high levels within the government because they might leak, they might resist in some way or other. And that covers assassinations, which a number of examples were given uh, in the um, Church Committee report. And I found since then that it also covers threats of nuclear weapons, which takes me back to my earlier area of expertise. Those come about as often as assassination attempts, which is to say every year or two, and they're handled as secretly at the time. You certainly changed your viewpoint as you learned more about what was going on in government. I presume I'm right on this. Yes. And uh, what was going on in Vietnam. Uh, what occurred, uh, what, was the, what was the watershed event or date that suddenly brought you up short and made you say, this is not all adding up? I think everyone who went to Vietnam uh, whether journalist or GI at the lowest level or uh, political officer or whoever learned very quickly that things were not adding up in terms of the impressions he'd taken with him from the newspapers, from presidential statements and so forth. And uh, more than that, nearly everyone who went there learned within the space of one year, if not two, that uh, success was extremely unlikely in any terms, whatever, and that thus the killing that was going on on both sides was very difficult to justify, which is a way of saying that it began to look like murder, to continue it, whatever one's sense was of the uh, intentions that had led us there in the first place. Something that made quite a difference for me on the question of what to do about that was when I read the Pentagon Papers and developed quite a new view as to what our intentions had been. To this day, most Americans, I think quite sincerely, hold on to the idea that we had very altruistic purposes initially in our early involvement. But the Pentagon Papers showed that that early involvement uh, consisted of assisting and encouraging, almost demanding and supporting the French in regaining control of a former imperial possession. This is not a purpose that is likely to be defined by most Americans as a, as a legitimate one, as a, as a just cause, as something that we have a right to kill for. And yet that's what we were doing. So reading the Pentagon Papers and seeing the continuity of our policy from that early day with the French uh, was very uh, jarring to me. And then the question was, uh, should one continue to do it to work for change within the government? Again, reading the Pentagon Papers showed me that advice of the kind I was capable of giving, and so many others were, we're not winning, this is not successful, don't believe the lies that are coming up through the chain of command. Presidents had all heard that. I realized that president after president had been told this very authoritatively, as clearly as I could tell him. And for reasons that were not clear to me, they were proving impervious to that advice. They were going on, and they were lying to the public about that. They were telling the public that they were about to win when in fact that was not the advice they were getting. That meant that if the policy was to be changed, it had to be changed from outside the executive uh -huh. branch by pressure brought to bear by the public or Congress. So, so your decision was that uh, there was no other way to do it then except to... Oh, I would spent years telling people in the executive branch what I had to tell them, in effect. And I'm saying what the Pentagon Papers showed, and, and for that matter, trying to get the very lessons of the Pentagon Papers. Your executive branch, could you talk to the president himself? Actually, I didn't talk to the president, but I had the opportunity to talk to cabinet-level people, mm -hmm. which very few people have, of course. Secretary McNamara, people, uh, Walt Rostow mm -hmm. in the White House, who, of course, was his assistant, mm -hmm. the undersecretary level uh, in the state, and so forth. So I, I had very good access. I wasn't... I couldn't tell myself that maybe next year I'll, I'll be able to talk to the important guys and really get this through. So again, as I said a moment ago, I've done that. Public disclosure was the answer, eh? I hoped it was the answer, and it proved to help. I hoped that the uh, public, if they understood what our policy really was, which is uh, a, a kind of unlimited willingness to continue and escalate this war in order to avoid what uh, the president defined as defeat. I thought they wouldn't, they wouldn't tolerate that, that they didn't want Americans to die in that cause, and they didn't want Americans to kill anymore. And I think that proved to be the case. When they got that information, the Americans did 
impact on it. Uh, Daniel, when the, uh, when the Supreme Court made its finding in the Pentagon Papers uh, case, uh, some people think, in fact, Frank Snap told me today, the former CIA man, uh, that, uh, that he felt that it's been misinterpreted by the press, by many people, that decision. He felt that it resulted in an attack on the First Amendment. Uh, he saw it as, a, as opening the door to, to prior restraint. Do, do you see it that way? Uh, well, this was the first attempt by, the, by any administration to prosecute someone for giving information to the American people. And it was an experiment then to see if the justices would simply write off the First Amendment and, and accept the first prior restraint. And in the course of that then, and, uh, some of the justices did then, uh, looking at the problem for the first time and quite hastily under the conditions, did come up with the judgment that they could imagine circumstances uh, in which prior restraint might be justified. They said this simply isn't one of them. By the way, that would imply that the, uh, the conditions would have to be pretty narrow because the Pentagon Papers was 7,000 pages of top secret material on plans and whatnot. I certainly judged uh, that it, the release of that would not by a single line or paragraph in any way harm national security. And in effect, the Supreme Court reached that same judgment. But uh, they did then, in the course of that, make the comment that perhaps in some other circumstances this restraint might be justified. And you could say, to that extent, yeah. the position had now been stated uh, for the first time. And you were certainly uh, privy to a lot of information that was not uh, the general information, a good part of it classified. You had an inside view and an overview of Vietnam that uh, many people did not have. What did you think of the quality of reporting that came out of the Vietnam War? Well, let me separate the reporting from Vietnam and the reporting from Washington. In Vietnam, the reporters got out to the field and talked both to Vietnamese officials, but in particular to American officials at low level, people who had often not been indoctrinated into the need to keep secrets, which is to say the need to lie to the public and to reporters, and who were not practiced at it. Uh, just Marine lieutenants, of the kind I had been, let's say, when I was in the Marines, or uh, captains and colonels, and people who felt so keenly about uh, how badly the war was going that they would have been hard to keep quiet, even if you had ordered them to do it. The fact then is that the reporters were getting a kind of reporting on the war which was not going up through channels at all. In other words, their picture of the war that they were presenting to the American public was far more accurate and realistic than was available typically at a uh, Corps headquarters and it was available really to Westmoreland in many ways and certainly uh, to uh, the White House. So there, uh, in many cases, you'd get a much better picture of uh, what was really happening uh, in Vietnam. And the, the American people were well served by that on the whole. And, of course, the television, with its special uh, concreteness, brought the war home to the American public and made it endable, made the movement possible. It occurs to me that the writing from Washington, which is rarely commented on, was terrible from beginning to end of the war, essentially, uh, in the sense, and I knew that very well, being in Washington before I went to Vietnam and after I went to Vietnam, knowing what was secret, knowing what the president was saying, and knowing that the uh, reporters in Washington seemed to be almost entirely uncritical, unskeptical of uh, what the officials were telling them. Watching my boss, McNaughton, fool reporters and seeing how easy it was to do, basically. Uh, these were, uh, the reporters uh, depended upon access to these high officials. Uh, they could not come out and say in print that they were skeptical uh, of what they were saying and get into that office again, basically. That's part of it. Part, most of the reporters in Washington simply believe the, the line, I would say, very much. So in terms of the much broader aspects of what was our policy, what was our aim, what were we up to, it proved to be uh, terribly easy to fool the reporters, and it was, they were fooled, uh, not only under Johnson, but after the Pentagon Papers came out, uh, under Nixon. I think to this day, the press has fallen down terribly on the question of coming to understand or enlighten the American public as to what Nixon's strategy was, what his plan was, uh, what his aims were, how to understand uh, 
by the man who said he would get us out of Vietnam and, and uh, was elected on that basis in 68. In fact, went on to drop twice the tonnage of World War II in his own first term in office. Well, Daniel, the, uh, the CIA men with whom we've talked tell us that they fed their term disinformation yes. to the correspondents in Vietnam. Right. Uh, in, in a very real sense, they use them, use them well, to their of, advantage. I, I doubt if it, all officials dealing with reporters thought in those terms. I mean, well, I think that's an, that's an effort. I, I, I suppose we would all agree that... As I.F. Stone says, all governments lie and nothing they say is to be believed. <laughs> and uh, that's, a, that's the place to start. Well, do you feel then, you would agree then, that correspondents out there, even though you've just said that they did a good job, they were used by the CIA. Uh, well, yeah? the ones who relied on the people who felt most responsible for presenting the policy the way the president wanted it, talking about now the station chief, the, uh, the source that a reporter would regard as, you know, worth platinum, you know, marvelous. But that man is working very consciously for the president. He cannot afford to uh, let any truth out. It would embarrass the, the president. CIA to station CIA chief. CIA station chief, or any high official. But quite the opposite now, the Peter Arnett's and the others who would get out to the field and would talk to CIA people lower in the field, or uh, civilian aid, AID people, uh, development, or military people were capable of getting very realistic information. That's, those people out there were in the, on the one hand, thought themselves in the course of fighting a war and were not happy about the way they saw it was being fought or how it was coming. They were not inclined to lie about it. And second, a lot of them cared a lot, both about our soldiers and about the Vietnamese at that level. They, they, they met them, and they were anguished about uh, what the war was doing to both of those people, and again, they were not inclined to lie. What do you see in the future in the way of uh, the problems the press will have and the government will have, the military will have, in the, in the prosecution of a war and the reporting of a war? Do you believe, do you believe that uh, we're going to have a repetition here on, of the, here on out of what happened in the Falkland Islands where they really controlled the press? It's very clear that the government learned the lesson that uh, it's hard to fight a, uh, a war that cannot be justified to a democratic electorate without censorship. You can't let that electorate see what's actually happening in contrast to what you say is happening. Uh, if it's the kind of war, unlike, let's say, World War II, which uh, is not going to be seen in terms of U.S. national security when people uh, look at it, and Vietnam could not seriously be uh, explained in those terms. Now, I do think the, less the press has learned, and to go back to the Washington side of this, as an outsider now, I have the impression that the press is looking much more critically at the justification, at what our policy is said to be in Nicaragua, you know, El Salvador and Guatemala. Take the Newsweek cover story on our operations, secret operations against Nicaragua. I could, could remember no counterpart for that uh, in my period in government. And I'm very glad to see that obviously some people in government have got the message that the press and the public needs to know when this kind of aggressive behavior that's leading us to another Vietnam. They're tough as a hoodwink, probably, I, in, yeah, in the past. And I think, above all, the press is asking better questions mm -hmm. now. Uh, possibly, by the way, Watergate made a considerable difference in the, in the uh, Washington side there. That was a chance for the Washington people to discover at last how much they'd been lied to before. It's just possible that that had a very educational effect on it. I think what you've just told me, if I interpret it correctly, that it, on the free press and our, our democracy, makes it almost impossible to sell a war, a bad war at least. I hope that's true, and certainly I think it's a, it is a great advantage we have here. I think the American people, informed by the media, that's where they got their information, were able to force a president to extricate us from a bad war, a president who wanted to keep that war going. Now, Russia doesn't have such a process to get it out of Viet Afghanistan. I don't think that's a, a strength of the Russian system. It means they are doomed to stay there much longer than they would be if uh, they had a press capable of embarrassing their own leaders and of criticizing and asking questions, and if they had a public that could bring pressure to bear. 
That's an advantage of the American system. And in fact, it's one of the main ones the, the, the Constitution was written to achieve, to limit the powers of a king-like leader to get us in, to keep us into war indefinitely. That was one of the first things in the minds of the people who wrote our Constitution. And the departure from Vietnam showed, with all its tragedy and all its brutality in many ways, showed democracy working, triumphing, in a way that was conceived 200 years ago.